Hello everyone. Thank you for your kind invitation to speak today. I am sorry that I cannot do so in person, but I'm honored to be here because I know we all share the same convictions. First, that the small farms of Asia, 70% of the world's 570 million total, are vital to the future food supply of the region. And second, that we can and we must do much more to invest in them. We all know how tough the last few years have been for small-scale farmers. They have been hit hard by COVID-19, price instability and the impact of climate change and biodiversity loss. Small-scale family farmers throughout all Asia have been hit particularly hard. With average farm sizes that are under two hectares across much of the Asia and the Pacific, these smallholder food producers are highly vulnerable to external forces and they really need our investments. Because family farming is the backbone of rural economies and of food systems everywhere. In fact, a quarter of us on the planet rely on small family farms for our livelihoods and our food security. Without family farms, many of us would not have eaten today. Not only are small farms efficient, they also have a lighter relative footprint on essential ecosystems they do not depend heavily on fresh water for crops and they preserve biodiversity instead of depleting it. But today, higher temperatures and more erratic and extreme weather threaten their livelihoods and the region's overall food security. To adapt, small family farms desperately need investments to overcome the growing risks that they are facing. Yet, they just get 0.8% of climate finance to help them adapt to extreme changes in our climate. This needs to increase because it is an investment in our collective future. Let's be clear, small farms are businesses. They need access to finance and tools to use it. They need to be fairly and decently compensated for both the food and the raw materials that they produce and for the environmental, biodiversity and watershed management services that they provide. And this is where the close collaboration between IFAD and the Asian Development Bank comes in. I am proud that we have been partners since IFAD's inception in 1977. Working together alongside farmers association and local and national governments, we have made a tangible difference to both the lives of millions of farmers and to sustainability in the region. Across Asia and the Pacific, our 570 million current portfolio, spanning from Pakistan to Nepal and from China to Tonga, aims to raise incomes, while also enhancing sustainability and preserving biodiversity. Our joint project in hilly areas of Nepal helped 67,000 farming households to raise their income and to reduce their use of chemicals. Drawing on local knowledge and traditional techniques for pest management, it introduced agroecological practices such as mixed cropping, biomulching and swales, an ancient innovation that helps gather water without irrigation systems. In the Philippines, we work with indigenous communities to develop sustainable agroforestry, coffee and fruit cultivation, reducing runoff and enhancing resilience against typhoon and drought or in Bangladesh, where we tap the Internet of Things to install remote water quality sensors that help fish farmers monitor water quality and oxygen levels when rainfall is scarce. The result is an ecological renaissance for the river Halda and an economic renaissance for the fishing communities. Ladies and gentlemen, IFAD prides itself as a partner in transforming food systems including in this time of changing climate and biodiversity. Over the decades, IFAD has been a pioneer in every aspect of agriculture and climate risk management, from index insurance to blended finance. In all our projects, rural people are important partners, contributing their ideas and experience at every stage from project design to implementation. Often they also invest alongside us. We make always sure that these projects benefit the most vulnerable, including youth, women and indigenous peoples. And we are good at what we do. 
In 2021, IFAD was ranked the most efficient and effective multilateral organization by the Center for Global Development. By leveraging our balance sheet and our partnerships, we convert every dollar contributed by our member state into six dollars invested on the ground. In our upcoming investment cycle 2025 to 2027, we are prioritizing nature-based solutions to restore and protect ecosystems, drawing upon the wisdom of scientists, farmers and indigenous peoples. Over the next three years, we aim to enhance the lives and resilience of 100 million rural people. Across Asia and the Pacific, the Asian Development Bank will be a vital partner in achieving all of these goals. At this time of dramatic and deadly climate change, I look forward to deepening our work with the Asian Development Bank. Together, we can improve the lives and incomes of small-scale farmers and of the communities and societies in which they live. We can ensure that they have the tools they need to build resilient livelihoods, to feed their families and communities, and to continue to play their crucial role in preserving biodiversity and a food secure future for everyone. Thank you very much. All right, well, thank you very much for that great introduction. And yeah, I do want to acknowledge the support from ADB for, for this work that we've done uh, uh, to try to look at uh, key aspects. Let's see, is, is the thing working? Can you bring out my PowerPoint? Uh, oh, there, okay. So what we're trying to look at several aspects of, of long-term uh, food security um, in Asia uh, and w with support from ADB. Uh, and let me just start by look, uh, talking about some of the goals of Asian agriculture policy, which we, we all know is Indian hunger, achieving food and nutrition security, uh, while at the same time promoting sustainable uh, resource-conserving agriculture. But uh, achieving these goals, of course, requires meeting key food system challenges. Uh, and these include, as you can see here, uh, the issue of climate change, which has already been raised uh, several times here, which reduces productivity and well-being in agriculture. And of course, agriculture is also uh, a major contributor to greenhouse gas emissions. Uh, uh, so for sustainable intensification, we, we do need to uh, reduce agriculture's food print. Water scarcity uh, is increasing with gro growing demand uh, from se many sectors and the rising cost of developing new, new, new water resources, which leads to constraints on, on supply. Agriculture productivity growth is slowing in many countries, while agriculture research and development expenditures are tending to decline in, in uh, most of Asia. So agriculture input subsidies um, distort production decisions and, and crowd out productive investments in, in public goods. At the same time, as we've heard, value chains are often inefficient with high marketing margins and high volumes of, of food, lost, um, f food lost and waste. So in this presentation, we're going to discuss prospects for meeting uh, these challenges under alternative investment scenarios uh, for Asian agriculture. And we won't have time to really discuss in detail, but the, fr the framework we're using is the impact modeling system that uh, IFRI has, which is a set of linked climate, water, food, and economic models uh, of, of uh, the world agriculture economy, uh, which generates estimates of production, consumption, food prices, and some environmental impacts uh, uh, for a, a quite detailed uh, highly disaggregated set of countries and regions, as, as you can see here, uh, including uh, 158 countries and 154 river basins. So we're taking a scenarios approach to, to this work, uh, starting from a reference scenario, which in, uh, takes the population and income trends from IPCC's uh, uh, SSP2, which is the middle of the, ro of the road, uh, demographics and economic growth, uh, and this is the most recent version uh, that was just released about three months ago. We also include business as usual, uh, prediction, projections of agricultural uh, investment and productivity growth, and we're looking in this particular presentation using the climate scenario RCP 7.0, uh, 
uh, which is a moderate to, relative, to somewhat severe uh, 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 pathway for climate change and using the IPSL uh, climate model. We also do uh, have done sensitivity analysis across different models and RCPs. We, we're using a number of alternative investment scenarios, including investment in agriculture R&D, irrigation and water, rural infrastructure, and repurposing repur of subsidies. So just briefly, here's a summary of the investment scenarios. So you can see in, in, in investment in agriculture productivity growth, we, we have three levels of investment that you can read there yourselves. In, in irrigation and water use efficiency, we have one scenario that just expands uh, irrigated area, and then another where, uh, in addition to that expansion, we have increased investments in, in water use efficiency through modernization, rehabilitation, and upgrading of systems. Investment in, in rural infrastructure includes rural roads, rail, electrification, as, as well as markets and cell phones to improve marketing efficiency and reduce post-harvest losses. Then we, we do a more comprehensive investment, which combines the scenarios uh, that you see there. Finally, we look at the issue of repurposing subsidies, which we've already heard about. Uh, and we designed this uh, scenario as redirecting 30% of subsidy payments to producers to the investment categories uh, described above for the eight countries in which we had, there is enough complete data. You can see those here. So briefly, let's talk about the uh, annual investment cost, 2020 to 2050, uh, under, under uh, uh, different scenarios. And you can see here business as usual on the left-hand side of the reference scenario, and the investment scenarios increment on the, on the right-hand graph. Let me apologize for the, the, the graphs are on different scales, so they're, they're not uh, directly comparable. But you, you can see here on the right-hand side, the, the increases are, are shown for the different categories and, and also the percentage increases for each category relative to, to the reference scenario. The, the total investments are, are summarized below uh, for the reference scenario and the comprehensive scenario. And you can see uh, for Asian Pacific, for example, the annual investments uh, in the reference scenario are about $40 billion a year and under the comprehensive investment. 68 uh, billion a year, or a 69% uh, increase. So let's start with some of the results that we derive from this. Let's, starting here, is we can see that the increased investments boost food consumption relative to the re reference scenario. Uh, and this shows changes in kilocalorie availability in, in 2050 compared to 2020. Uh, in, the, in the reference scenario and the comprehensive uh, Scenario. Let's look at Asia and the Pacific. So you, you, you do get, of course, Im improvements in the reference scenario across uh, different food groups other than the cereals, which actually has a negative uh, increase. So you, uh, you've seen already the, p the possibilities of diversification. But then, of course, the comprehensive scenario boosts that, pr uh, that consumption substantially uh, with the total increasing, as you can see, by about 30% compared to that reference scenario. And we do see diversification, as you can see here, that looking at the different food groups, the cereals in particular, uh, the share declines uh, between 2020 and 2050, uh, while, while fruits and vegetables, uh, oils and sugars, and, and animal products increase somewhat. And it says this, actually, this slide actually understates the amount of diversification. If you looked at the, the share in the increase between 2020 and 2050 rather than the, the end point, you'd see a, a greater uh, change in the, in the dietary patterns. The investments also, of course, re, uh, increase projected crop yields. And you see here uh, project, projected crop yields under, for the different regions and for Asia and the Pacific, for, for the reference scenario, and the high R&D scenario and, and the comprehensive scenario. So for example, for Asian Pacific in, in 2050, there's an increase from bare, uh, eight and a half uh, tons per hectare uh, to over 10 tons per hectare. And you see comparable increases in the different uh, scenarios. So you do get substantial in, uh, yield increases. And these, together with changing patterns in consumption, 
uh, have a si substantial influence on food prices as well. So again, we're looking at the alternative scenarios. Uh, you can see in the reference scenario, prices increase over time for all, uh, all the commodities here. Some relatively slowly, like animal products, others quite high, cereals, fruits and vegetables, and, and roots and tubers. But in all cases, you get uh, uh, substantial reductions in prices over time uh, due to the uh, in increased investments. These, the set, these changes uh, that I've just talked to you about have then very significant impacts on the risk of hunger uh, in Asia. And here we start with, look, we're going to have three slides here. The first is Asian Pacific, uh, the shares and population hunger of hungry in Asian Pacific. And here the, for the region as a whole, you can see even on the reference scenario, you get very rapid Im improvements. And, uh, and even by 2030, you're actually coming close to meeting the SDG2 goal of under 5% hunger by 2030. Uh, but you also see that uh, it investments uh, greatly accelerate the reductions and, and cut the, sorry, cut hunger substantially relative to that, to the reference scenario. Uh, and the other point to make here is that in sense, these uh, scenarios are too optimistic because a huge amount of this ch change is due to success in China and also to Southeast Asia, whereas other regions aren't necessarily faring as well. Here, for example, uh, we see South Asia, uh, which begins in 2020 with about 15% uh, of, of Hungary, uh, of the total population. And looking at, at the blue line, you see in 2030, it's still at 8% uh, and, can, uh, and reaches uh, about 5% after, just after 2035, where you get much faster improvement uh, in and actually meet the SDG goals uh, with the higher investment. But South Asia in general is, has quite a bit of success par in, in part due to the very rapid uh, growth in income. Central and West Afri Asia is another example, uh, goes from about 14% and has a much slower trajectory of, of reducing hunger. Uh, with, it doesn't even reach the uh, hunger target in 2050 under the re reference scenario. Well, it does, managed to meet it by about 2040, uh, just past 2040 under the high investment scenario. We also look at uh, projected nutrient availability for selected countries here. This one is for iron. We also look at zinc and vitamin A in, in the analysis. And you, and you can see there that you, we get uh, increased availability of these important nutrients uh, uh, under the reference, uh, sorry, under the uh, investment scenarios, but in, in fact, it, it's somewhat slow, to be honest, so a lot more has to be done here. Uh, India, you can see, improves relative to the reference scenario, but still under the uh, recommended uh, uh, intakes for, for iron. Kazakhstan and the Philippines, as other examples, are above the, uh, the recommended intakes and do imp improve. So we're getting some improvement in nutrient uh, uh, availability uh, un under these references also. But of course, as we've heard also, distributional concerns are, are of utmost importance with many not being able to access uh, even this level of nutrients. Projected water use here under different scenarios, blue water is the water and surface reservoirs and aquifers delivered by irrigation. And we look at these, you can look across the various regions and just the summaries briefly for Asia and Pacific. When you only invest in, uh, in expanded irrigation, that your EXP uh, scenario, by 2050, you actually increased water use by 2%. But when you use this, have the same trajectory of investment in irrigation together with uh, investment in water use efficiency, you can actually reduce water use by uh, about 7.5% while maintaining the growth uh, in irrigated areas. So again, these scenarios can be highly effective there. Next, we have investment in agricultural R&D, reducing agricultural uh, greenhouse gas emissions. So here we have emissions in million tons of, of CO2 equivalent, again by region. And we, we see here for all regions, and, and then Asia and Pacific on the right-hand side, even in the reference scenario, there is some improvement over time in re reducing greenhouse gas emissions due to 
uh, a reduction over time of, of, the, of the emissions intensity of agriculture per, per dollar value uh, in agri agriculture. But again, we, we see how th these improvements can be accelerated under the high, higher investment uh, 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 analysis uh, shown this one for the agriculture productivity growth, which shows uh, so, you know, by 2050, we, we have reduced the initial, uh, initial emissions in, in Asia and Pacific by a third here. And that's because, because of land saving productivity growth together with generation adoption of technologies such as conservation tillage, uh, uh, precision agriculture, uh, and improved uh, management of rice and, and livestock, uh, among others. The final scenario that we'll look at really quickly is just a quick summary of the investments in the rural infrastructure uh, in, uh, investments. We're under this scenario, in this one together with the uh, re repurposing of subsidies, I think, think can be seen as, as possible best buy in investments from, from the analysis. As you can see, the, the broad-based rural infrastructure investment uh, cuts post-harvest losses by about 50%. In, in the region while also reducing marketing margin, increasing production by one to 5%, but more importantly, lowering food prices and, and reducing hunger uh, by 16 uh, million people in 2035 compared to the reference scenario. Uh, the repurposing of agriculture sector government subsidies in just these eight countries that we show uh, is also very powerful. And remember, that's only 30% of the subsidies. So. For these, uh, this repurposing benefits not just those countries, but the entire uh, ADB region, increasing ag output by 17% and reducing hunger by 51 million people, or 30% in 2035. 20, so that's a little story of, of the power of reallocating uh, those subsidies in, into productive investments. So just a few uh, conclusions then. Uh, as we saw here, in increased investments in Agricultural productivity, irrigation, uh, and water use efficiency are highly effective, and there I, I list the, the ways uh, there. But of course, what we saw is not good is not good enough. Uh, so beyond th these investments, you need investments in health, nutrition, clean water and sanitation, and education uh, to further reduce hunger and child malnutrition and improve sustainability. In addition, there's always going to be some vulnerable people who aren't reached. Uh, through these kinds of investments. Uh, so here you need income transfers and safety nets that can help, uh, help them through short-term stresses or disasters and improve uh, their nutrition and health over time. In, a, in addition, the impact of these investments would be further increased by improvements in the enabling environment for sustainable intensification, including extension and innovation systems to enhance uptake of technology, gender responsive policies and investments to increase women's access to land, finance, natural resources and information, and, and design of greenhouse gas emissions reduction policies, uh, including uh, how to manage carbon payments uh, in, in this system. Finally, is uh, increasing access to farmer and sectoral finance to support private investment as well as uh, public investment. We can see here that a well-targeted portfolio of investments and policy reforms can meet the goals uh, of Asian agriculture policy, even in the face of these significant food system challenges. Finally, uh, I was asked to pr provide some key questions for, for discussion coming out of this work. I mean, one that we didn't direct uh, uh, address directly is that there are ten, uh, tendencies showing that rural urban migration and, and as well as innovations in crop breeding systems, farming systems, and digital technologies are, are improving economies of scale uh, in, in agriculture in Asia, uh, which is leading to some pressure to consolidate land ownership or operational sizes of farms. So the question is, how can growth uh, and the welfare of small farmers be balanced uh, in such a uh, transition? Next is how can agriculture health and nutrition policies be integrated for maximum impact, getting out of the silos of these different policies. 
Another question then is, should investments be allocated specifically to different crops to further encourage diet diversification, moving investment, for example, from cereals to, to fruits and vegetables? How, and finally, how can policymakers address the, the big political economy challenge of repurposing agriculture subsidies? Thank you. <laughs>